Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Tracy and Todd and to Sages for the opportunity uh, to present today. Uh, these are my disclosures, which I think are not relevant to this talk. So let's begin with a little bit of history. So Dr. Henri um, Hartman was born in Paris in 1860. And please excuse my French. I'm going to use a couple of French words, but I don't speak French. So um, he graduated from medical school in 1884 and um, joined as a staff surgeon um, at the Hotel Dieu. And he became professor and chair of the department by 1909. He was actually really clinically busy, having over 1,000 operations per year uh, for 20 years. He was well known for having very precise operative and post-operative notes. And his work includes uh, writings in gynecology, breast, gastric, biliary, surgery, war injuries, and cancer. And so his clinic at the Hotel Dieu became very well known internationally. And he became an honorary fellow of the American Surgical Association, as well as the Royal College of Surgeons in, uh, of England and Ireland. And in France, he was a grand officer in the Legion of Honor. So he lived until the age of 92 died in 1952. So he was well known for his biliary and gastric work. And so as you can see in many anatomy textbooks, the ampulla um, actually has his name, a Hartman's pouch, uh, which is an important landmark um, on the path to a safe cholecystectomy. Hartman's pouch also refers to the distal rectal stump uh, that is left after the sigmoid is resected and the end colostomy is fashioned. And so the Hartman's procedure uh, was originally described uh, as a treatment for a bleeding or obstructing uh, carcinoma. And so the distal rectal stump was closed and the colostomy was, uh, was brought up. The initial intent was actually, it was a final operation. There was never an intent, at least originally, to ever restore GI continuity um, after this operation. And so you have a patient with perforated diverticulitis. And so what's the right treatment? Well, honestly, it depends what year it is, and it depends on who you ask. If it's 1907 and you ask Dr. Mayo, well, his answer would be a three-stage procedure. So the three-stage procedure was actually quite common practice. Um, and the first report was by Dr. Mayo um, in 1907, and the classic three-stage procedure was first uh, a diverting colostomy, the second operation was the resection of the diseased uh, colon segment with uh, reestablishment of GI continuity, and then the third procedure was actually uh, closing the colostomy. So three operations. In 1924, the Mayo Clinic presented its results and felt that this was really the safest uh, way to approach perforated diverticulitis because it would decrease um, postoperative uh, mortality and morbidity in, in these patients. In 1930, Rankin and Brown uh, published on standardizing this uh, three-stage approach. Um, and for the next 20 years, the recommendation really was to perform a preliminary um, diverting colostomy um, because it was felt that in the acute setting it was just too dangerous to uh, do the resection and that you could cause iatrogenic complications um, and increase morbidity. Lockhart Mummery and Smithwick were also proponents of this approach. Um, and in 1976, uh, Dr. Klassen and his group published in the Annals of Surgery also with this um, three-staged approach. Around this time, though, controversy increased, and there were papers published um, initially, you know, Smithy in 1966, Large in 64, and Eng in 77, saying that perhaps a three-stage procedure was actually worse than a two-stage, and um, these surgeons were advocates of a two-stage procedure, feeling um, they advocated the two-stage resection because they felt that after the initial improvement of the um, the colostomy that patients began to deteriorate because the segment of diseased bowel was still in place and would act as a nidus for infection um, or sepsis. And so through this time, um, the morbidity of perforated diverticulitis remained quite high. And honestly, the controversy remained because there was no real evidence except for expert opinion and small case series. And so enter 
the two-stage procedure, um, what we know now as the Hartman's resection. So in the 1980s and 90s, um, surgical practice shifted more towards this uh, two-stage um, operation where in the initial stage, the disease segment of colon was removed in an end colostomy fashioned, and then the second stage uh, was actually the continuity, uh, the restoration of GI continuity. So Krakowski and Matheson and Grief reported in their series that patients who had received an initial resection um, had lower uh, postoperative morbidity and mortality than those patients who had a uh, disease segment left in place. So um, they were proponents of this uh, two-stage operation. Unfortunately, their reviews were not very systematic, and it's really hard to tell whether the two groups are really comparable, the disease segment and the, and the resection segment. So then in 1993, there was a randomized trial um, by Kronberg, and they actually concluded that the three-stage approach was superior than the resection approach because of lower post-operative mortality. Unfortunately, oh, but for their Hinchy 4 group, the mortality was equal in both groups. Unfortunately for their trial, they were actually only able to recruit an average about four patients a year, and so they ended up with 62 patients operated on by 27 different surgeons over a period of 14 years. So it's really hard to kind of draw major conclusions from that study. Um, in 2000, there was an, an additional study um, that then uh, concluded that the uh, resection, uh, the two-stage procedure was superior to the three-stage because patients had a decreased risk of post-op peritonitis, and they also had a decreased risk of needing a reoperation. Interestingly, in this study, the post-op mor mortality of the three-stage was actually lower than the two-stage, uh, but it wasn't statistically significant. And so controversy remained um, about the two-stage and three-stage, but in, two th in 2000, ASCRS published guidelines um, saying that the three-stage was actually no longer recommended for most patients because of the associated morbidity and mortality. And so the way the Hartman's procedure was originally described, it was an alternative method for dealing with a bleeding or obstructing carcinoma um, with no plans of, GI, of establishing GI continuity in the future. So we do know that many patients to this day um, never undergo that restoration of GI continuity and do remain with permanent stomas. And so Maggard in 2004 looked at over 1,000 patients, and in that study, the reversal rate was about 65% at a four-year follow-up. Similarly, in 2009, in a study of um, over 150 patients, the reversal rate was 45%. In that same study, when they looked at patients who had received a resection and an anastomosis with a lupuleostomy, the reversal rate went up to 74%. And when they looked at the um, post-Hartman's reversal uh, morbidity, it was up to 44%. And so we know that the restoration of GI continuity after a Hartman's can be quite technically challenging and associated with significant morbidity and mortality. So in 2005, um, Aiden looked at um, patients, over 120 patients, and looked at surgical complications after a Hartman's reversal versus those that had had uh, primary anastomosis and found a higher rate of surgical complications in the Hartman's reversal group. Similarly, in this study in 2010 of over 87 patients who had undergone emergency surgery, um, 60 had undergone a Hartman's and 27 a primary anastomosis. They also found that postoperative complications were higher in the Hartman's group. So some have advocated uh, laparoscopy as a potential way of decreasing this morbidity. Um, so in 2015, there was a uh, propensity-matched uh, study that looked at 39 patients who had undergone a uh, laparoscopic Hartman's procedure versus uh, 78 who had undergone an open procedure, and they were case-match controlled. Um, they looked at length of stay, uh, post-op morbidity, and st uh, stoma-free uh, survival, and this study did favor the laparoscopic approach. 
There have been several studies also looking at reversing the Hartman's laparoscopically versus open, and there is some conflicting data. Um, it appears that there's um, no short-term benefit, but when you look at six months or longer, there does appear to be a benefit for the laparoscopic group, especially with abdominal wall complications. In 2017, there was a Cochrane review that concluded that there was insufficient evidence uh, to support or refute the use of laparoscopy in acute diverticulitis. So there are uh, several non-randomized studies uh, that do support primary anastomosis in comparison to a Hartman's showing that primary anastomosis um, is not worse, does not have worse morbidity or mortality. Some of these studies even show improved morbidity and mortality as compared to Hartman's. Now, um, these studies are plagued for our selection bias, but um, let's go through a couple of these. So 2006, 41 patients, 33, 33 with primary anastomosis, an additional three with a loop ileostomy, five with a Hartman's, found that mortality was higher in the Hartman's group when compared uh, to the primary anastomosis group. Salem in 2004 did a meta-analysis, including 54 studies that included Hartman's patients and 50 studies with primary anastomosis. They looked at mortality, SSI rate, stoma complications, and leak, and did find that the anastomosis group did no worse than the Hartman's group. In 2006, over 900 patients, also looking at primary anastomosis versus Hartman's, they looked at mortality, uh, which was favorable for the anastomosis group, Mortality after emergency surgery, also favorable to the anastomosis group, but found no difference in mortality if the Hinchy was greater than two. In 2018, um, Gatcha Bayer reviewed 17 studies, and they looked at organ space SSIs as well as uh, stoma non-reversal rate and felt that it was lower in um, the primary anastomosis group but they did note that operative times uh, were longer uh, for that group. In 2012, um, uh, Ober, Oberkofer uh, published in the Annals of Surgery a uh, multicenter trial looking at purulent and feculent peritonitis for diverticulitis. And interestingly, the study actually had to close early due to some secondary endpoints as all, and, and decreased accrual. So they ended up analyzing just 30 patients who had undergone Hartman's and 32 who had undergone a primary anastomosis. And so overall, the mortality morbidity between the two groups was very similar. Um, the reversal rate was higher for the primary anastomosis group with the loop ileostomy, 90% versus 57%. Serious complications were significantly different. In the uh, primary anastomosis group with the loop ileostomy, it was zero versus 20% in the Hartman's group. They also looked at length of stay, hospital cost, and OR time, and in their study, they actually found that the anastomosis group um, uh, did better in, on all those counts. And so in 2014, ASCRS actually revised their guidelines and included primary anastomosis with or without a loop ileostomy as an option for perforated diverticulitis. And so in conclusion, the standard of care for perforated diverticulitis has really changed over the century, really over the decades. Controversy existed between two-stage and three-stage, and now with primary anastomosis, perhaps controversy with lavage, without resection. The Hartman's procedure is definitely safe uh, for perforated diverticulitis, but it does carry inherent risks of non-reversal and significant morbidity uh, at the time of uh, reestablishing GI continuity. Um, laparoscopy may be of benefit um, in some of these cases, but at this time there's insufficient data. And so there is evidence that primary anastomosis can be safe um, in some patients, and, but I think that the overall decision for an anastomosis should really be based on patient stability and, and clinical factors. Thank you.